today we are doing um, sort of a gospel reminder part two. Last week, uh, we had a visitor named Harold. I saw him. He was in Bible class. Where'd you go, Harold? Oh, there you are. Hey, buddy. Uh, anyway, uh, I, Josh and I talked with Harold for a while uh, until about the time my kids had finished lunch at Rubio's. But, uh, but he's interesting to talk to. Uh, Harold, uh, I think he said he's about 80 years old or something. And uh, he, he, uh, he was an elder at the 37th Atlantic uh, Church of Christ in Long Beach. Uh, back when they were, he said, I think over 800 in their attendance. And, um, and uh, I remember that church because I did King's Camp with them. And I knew Dino Maizano, the youth minister, and he's a great guy. And so I remember working with them when they were a big, thriving church. And uh, Harold said he had visited with them, I, I guess, recently. And they were just down to, uh, you know, a uh, hundred or more, uh, and mostly seniors. And, um, and he, he tried to have a conversation with them about kind of what's going on and try to figure that out. Um, but I think he told me he visited 14 churches of Christ recently. And uh, basically the same story all over is dwindling and mostly seniors. There's something systemic. There's something in our DNA. Uh, we had another visiting family, young family. Uh, dad and mom were here. Uh, daughter, about 12 years old. And son, I think maybe eight or so. And uh, grandma. And they were all here last week. And I was talking to him as well before talking to Harold. And uh, they told me they had been hunting, looking around for a church. And they were trying to find a church that had any young people in it. The last church they went to, the, the, the members there said, hey, you can be the start of our new youth group. <laughs> There's something systemic. There's something in the DNA. And it's happening. Now, I, I want to say what I think the issue is, and I want to say it based on the fact that I've been in full-time ministry in the Church of Christ for 25 years. I went to the School of Evangelism for two years. I graduated there. I got the certificate. I had... Uh, interaction with a lot of leaders in the Church of Christ. I taught at the School of Evangelism for a few years and had interaction with the leaders and, and elders and ministers of the Churches of Christ. I've been to 25 Pepperdine lectureships where I spent a week hanging out with ministers and elders and members of the Churches of Christ. So I think I have a perspective. I have a Bible study that I started online. It's got 6,240 members now called Churches of Christ Open Discussion where I'm talking with elders and ministers and members of our churches openly about what's going on. So I think I have something to say. You can disagree with me if you want. And what I'm going to say is kind of about us, but maybe not so much about Sunny Hills, but maybe about Sunny Hills. You can determine that. But I just want to talk overall about where I think the issue, or at least a main issue, lies. And that is, I believe we failed. We failed in this principle, this very simple principle. I want you to read this principle with me. The main thing is that we keep the main thing, what? The main thing. I believe we failed systemically to do that. Not because we haven't chosen a main thing, we have. We have a main thing. And we'll fight about that main thing, and we'll get in our trenches, and get in our foxholes, and we will kill each other over the main thing that we have. And what I'm suggesting is, I believe we have the wrong main thing. It's the wrong one. What is that main thing? What have we adopted as the main thing? i got to remember to do this one, too. We've decided... That somewhere along the line, somebody went through and gathered up all the puzzle pieces from the New Testament that talk about a church. And they, and they arranged them all, they arranged all those puzzle pieces so that we could be the right church. And we could have the right kind of assembly with all the right things going on. And so that we could have the right organization of that church. And so we could have the right leadership of that church. And have all the right doctrines in that church. That's the main thing. I've heard people fighting about it for 25 years as a full-time minister and 30-something years as a Christian. 
That is the main thing. And I'll tell you what, they will tell you if one of these pieces is not right and you don't have this perfect pattern, this Holy Spirit inspired pattern of the true church, you're going to get native and abahued. You know it's true. Say amen if you know it's true. You've heard it. I hear it all the time. If you don't have the right church in the right way and the right time and the right people and doing it all right, bam! Smite me, almighty smiter, is what you're looking for. Right? It's not true. It's not true. There's a lot of problems with that main thing. I'll tell you, some of the problems with the main thing, this main thing is, nobody cares about that anymore. You're new people, you're visitors, and boy, we have lots of visitors. And young people, they haven't cared for decades about these fights. For decades. And it's true because you've seen the young people aren't, aren't staying in our churches. And new members aren't, aren't plugging in. We get some, and we're praise God at Sunny Hills. This church is powerful and alive and awesome. But, but systemically, our DNA has a problem where people are just not interested in this stuff. It doesn't move anybody to fight about who's got it right. What people are looking for is a church where people pursue God. They want to be a part of a group where people have a passionate experience with God, where he's moving in our lives right now and in the lives of, of a body of Christ. They want to be part of a church where people are building community, where they're wanted, where they're needed, where they feel like they have a place, where they can bless others, a community. This is what they want. And they want to be in a place where compassion is being poured out, just like it poured out of Jesus. This is, what, this is what inspires people. But arguing about who's got the right whatever is irrelevant anymore. It's not the main thing. And it wasn't Paul's main thing. And I can show it. We've been studying the book of 1 uh, Corinthians for the better part of this year, haven't we? In all this book, we should have been able to see that for Paul... That's not the main thing. How do we know? Because the Corinthian church, did they have any pieces out of place? If we've seen anything, we've seen that this is a church with pieces out of place. What was their communion like? Can you imagine if our communion was like that every Sunday morning? Don't you think somebody would be yelling Nadab and Abihu at us? Right? Having a, a real wine at their communion and people getting drunk having a real nice meal and somebody hogging all the food. They didn't have a divinely inspired pattern. Holy Spirit. Did they have some problems with their doctrine of the Holy Spirit in Corinth? We've been talking about that. They were a mess in how they understood what the purpose of the Holy Spirit was. It was all about me and, hey, look at me, and if I could just put on a great show, then you'd be saved. They didn't understand the Holy Spirit. Paul had to correct them. He corrected them about women issues, coverings and silence and stuff. We see him correcting them. He corrected them about with their ideas about marriage or celibacy or even some sexual morality and temple prostitutes. Correcting them about all this stuff. They were a mess. And even their assembly activities. They were just sure if we all just spoke in tongues that people would be saved. And Paul says, no, you got it all wrong. They need to hear prophecy. We just heard that a couple weeks ago. The church of Corinth did not have a divine inspired pattern. They didn't. They didn't follow any of it. They were a mess. And when Paul corrects them, here's how one of the ways, I'm going to show you too, one of the ways I know that th that was not the main thing for Paul. When he corrects them, he corrects them not by giving them the divine inspired pattern. He doesn't correct them by saying, here's exactly the way the church is supposed to be organized, and here's what you're supposed to be doing on a Sunday morning, and here's who's supposed to be doing it, and who's not, and here's how you're supposed to be doing it, and how you're not. He doesn't do any of that. His, his focus to the church is he's painting a different picture to solve these problems. He says, be perfectly united in mind and thought. Be concerned about your brother's conscience in your freedom and your eating of these meats that you, you know are okay with Jesus, but, but you're killing your brother's conscience when they're eating with you. You're, you're ruining the relationship. Don't do that. Stop taking each other to court. You're not showing Jesus by doing that to your brother. 
Share the Lord's Supper. Be concerned about the poor. Are you getting this? You see the picture he's painting? Honor other people's gifts, even the least ones. Honor them above your own. And acknowledge that God's Spirit is working through them to do that. And then 1 Corinthians 13. A treatise on what will fix the Corinthian church. This is the picture Paul gives of what will fix the Corinthian church. Is this right? Have we, looked, have we seen that all this time? Did we read 1 Corinthians 13? This is what will fix the Corinthian church. But there's something else. So here's this church. It's got all these issues. It's, it's completely a mess. And, and not only does Paul not give a, here's a divine pattern that you have to follow to fix it all, but instead he portrays love and how they ought to be loving each other. But not only that, he not only doesn't give them the native and abayu speech, which we might expect because of how much they have wrong, right? He doesn't give them the native and abayu. But he gives them a whole lot of words like these. Remember, this is the messed up church without the divinely authorized pattern of any of it. And he says to the church of God that's in Corinth, to those what? Sanctified in Christ Jesus. Called to be what? Saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus. That in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and knowledge. Even as the testimony about Christ was what? Confirmed in you. So that you're not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord and uh, Savior Jesus Christ. Who will sustain you to the end? What? Guiltless. Where's the native going to buy you? Guiltless. In the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is faithful by whom you were called in the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. These are the kind of words, hallelujah, he's right. These are the words that Paul has for a church that's a complete mess in regard to all those things that are the main thing in our heritage. But there's more. In chapter 3, he says, brothers. He calls them brothers. Could, I could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. You're still worldly, you're still carnal, but you're still infants where? In Christ. Infants in Christ. You're my brothers and sister, you're saved. Do you have the pattern? Not a chance. But you're saved and you're my brothers. And he goes on in the same chapter to say, and he's talking about building with wood, hay, and straw. We brought this up a bunch of times in this letter. He goes on to say, if anyone's work is burned up, like, like you've spent your whole life building this house of faith as an immature Christian and you really didn't accomplish hardly anything at all and everything you did accomplish is going to be burned up, is it Nadab going to buy you for you? He says, no, he himself will suffer loss, but though he himself will be what? Saved. saved. But one escaping through the flames. It's close, but saved. And then last week we saw this text. I want to remind you of the gospel I preached, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being what? This is the Corinthian church. The people without any of this pattern thing. They are the church standing in the gospel and being saved by it. They don't have a divine authorized pattern. That's not their main thing. But he goes on. And he says this. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. So here's the case for you Corinthians. If Christ has not been raised, if the gospel's not true, you're still in your sins. But, in fact, what? The fact is Christ has been raised from the dead. So, so that other scenario is not true. So in fact, because Christ has been raised from the dead, your faith is not what? Futile. And you are not what? Still in your sins. As far as Paul can tell, these Corinthians are saved in the gospel, by the gospel, and they are no longer in their sins as a completely messed up church without a divinely authorized pattern of anything. And then the last one in this chapter, at the end of the chapter, 
in talking about them receiving the, the, uh, the resurrection body and being uh, transformed by God in the twinkling of an eye and, and being raised incorruptible, he says, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Why doesn't death have a victory and a sting in the Corinthian church? Because the sting of death is what? Sin. But they're not in their sin. They're saved by the gospel. They're not in their sins. So death has no victory, and death has no sting. And so, so Paul is saying, you guys are the saved people in the gospel. And so the main thing for them was not what has been the main thing, by and large, in the churches of Christ. It wasn't. But there's a main thing revealed here. There is a main thing revealed. If you notice, it's not, it's not that. If you notice, when Paul said this phrase, and we looked at it last week, when he says, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached, in which you're being saved, you remember he added this phrase, if, that's a big if, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. What was the word he preached to them? He says it, he makes it clear. I want to remind you of what I preached to you, the gospel. And after he talks about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and all the people Jesus appeared to, he said, that's what I or they or whoever preached it, that's what we preached to you and that's what you believed. It, so, so this is the gospel by which you're being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached, which is the gospel. If they're holding fast to the gospel, they're saved. But if they're not, what does he say there at the end? Unless you believed in vain. All the other mess, Paul doesn't call into question their faith. All the other mess, he doesn't suggest that there might be a problem with the Nadab and Abihu thing coming. But when the gospel is not being believed, Paul is able to say, well, that's, that's um, if, if you hold on to. If you don't hold on to the gospel, then we may have a problem. That's what he says. See? For Paul, the main thing is the gospel. The gospel's the main thing. Always has been. It's the main thing. It's what we need to be about. And so Paul says at the end of this chapter, in response to where's the victory of death, it doesn't have it. Jesus is the victory. And so he says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Death didn't get the victory. We have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, through that gospel he had just preached about Jesus Christ. And therefore, my beloved, beloved brothers, be steadfast, be immovable, and always abounding in what? The work of the Lord is not to go out with a message that says we have the right church with the right authority and the right uh, people working and the right leadership and the right uh, uh, Sunday morning stuff going on. That is not the work that Paul is talking about. Paul is talking about the work of getting the gospel out. Of letting people know that Jesus saves. Their sins are forgiven in Christ. And so Paul describes that in 2 Corinthians. He gives this message. He says, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us what? What did he give us? What's our work? The ministry of reconciliation. It's our work. And he says, that is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses or their sins against them. We in Christ have found that. There's a whole world out there who has not. They're still in their sins. What have we been called to do? Be Christ's ambassadors. To bring out He's, God's entrusted us with the ministry of reconciliation. So, so we are his ambassadors bringing this message out. And here's the message. That, that we're, this is our message to the world. We implore you on behalf of Christ. This is our message to the world. What? Be reconciled to God. Or have your sins forgiven. Have God save you. Jesus died for you. That's our message. For, for our sake, and I, I have this in my head, God made him who had no sin to be sin, 
so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's, it's ingrained in my head. But that's what it says there, that Jesus became that sin to could kill it on the cross so that we could become the righteousness of God. That's the message of the gospel. That's the message we've been entrusted with. That's what we've been sent out to tell people. And so finally, what about the freedom? The freedom Paul had to get this message out. This is, this is part of the failure of having this kind of idea about the perfectly put together puzzle of the, of the right church and the right doctrine and the right leadership, which no author of the scripture put together. Somebody decided to pull all those pieces out and put them together. But here's the problem with it. You can't move. There's no freedom. You can't do anything because you're afraid you're going to take a piece of the puzzle out of step. And then bam! Paul had tremendous freedom. And I want you to hear it here. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might do what? To the Jews I became as a Jew. Did you know that when Paul went back to Jerusalem, did you know that uh, after his missionary journeys and out there preaching to the Gentiles, the Jews and the Jewish, some of the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem started to think Paul was teaching against Moses, which in a sense he had been. But James came to Paul, I think it's in Acts 21, but James came to Paul and said, hey, some people are getting the idea that you're not really for like the Jews anymore, so what's up with that? What do we do about that? And, and, and James said, listen, this will help everybody. Why don't you take a Jewish vow? This has nothing to do with Christianity. This is not part of the authorized pattern. He has no authority from God to do this. Or maybe he does. But not the way we've thought. But James says, take this Jewish vow. And in fact, pay for those two guys to go through it too. So that everyone will know that you're not speaking against Moses and the temple. And you know what Paul does? He said, let's do it. Because for Paul, he wasn't worried that what would people think. He wasn't worried, well, this isn't authorized. He wasn't worried that those guys may never come to understand Jesus in a different way. Paul could see that this would advance the cause of the gospel. It was Jewish. It was a Jewish thing. He was paying for others. He left that into God's hands. This would advance the cause of the gospel to make it that the Jewish nation didn't look at Paul as an enemy. He wanted them to hear the gospel. And so he took this vow and paid for others to do it too. Paul was free to do whatever it took to get the gospel out. So to the Jews, I became a Jew. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might what? Win those under the law. I think he's talking about that vow and all he did in that regard. But he goes on, I think this is my last slide. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win whom? The weak. I've become what? All things to all people, so that by what means? All means. I might save some. By any means, I'm free to do whatever it takes to get the gospel into people who don't know it. I do it all for the sake of the gospel so I can share with them in the blessing. I knew that was my last slide. That, listen, I'm, I'm positive that this has bound us. This idea that we've got to get everything right. We've got to be the right church with all this right stuff in order for God to be pleased. And I just want to say, we made up that pattern. No author of Scripture says, let me give you this pattern. The pattern's Jesus. The pattern we're given is love and Jesus. But, but someone came along... And they said, look, if we take all these things the church did and we create, here it is, here's the perfect church. That church didn't exist in the first century. It didn't exist in Acts chapter 2. But the church in Acts chapter 2 grew like wildfire. Let 
We need to hear this. Wherever going forward, wherever God's going to take us, we need to know. God wants us to be free. Free to get the gospel to people who don't know Jesus, who don't know salvation, who haven't had their sins forgiven. Free to do it in whatever way that we can reach into their lives. Let's pray. Father, please, please fill us with your spirit and empower us. Sunny Hills is an amazing place filled with the spirit of Christ and love, filled with, with servant hearts and generous hearts. But Father, in whatever way, we are still bound by what's killing our other churches. I pray, Father, you would free us from those, those shackles. Free us to follow you into the lives of people who don't know you. Raise us up and help us to see the fruit of your spirit in our lives and in in this church. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a response this morning to the gospel, uh, to anything I've said, you're welcome to come up here and talk with us about it, talk with me about it. Uh, I'd love to be in prayer with you about whatever you're going through. We're going to pass in the cards if you have any left. I know they were passed earlier. Uh, and we're going to stand up while Eric comes up with the, uh, collecting the cards and while Ron leads us in a closing song, I believe. Where'd Ron go? <laughs>